Namaskar and hello everyone. A very good evening to all of you. Very happy to have you here on a Saturday evening. As Teach for India enters Kolkata in the next academic year, our eighth site today, we are assembling together from different parts of India, especially East India, to talk about the transformational power of education. Talking about education always reminds me of Rabindranath Tagore's quote, as he says, the highest education is that which does not merely give us information, but makes our life in harmony with all existence. For him, education means enabling the mind to find out the ultimate truth that emancipates us from the bondage of dust and gives us wealth, not of things, but of inner light, not of power, but of love. It is a process of enlightenment. It is divine wealth. It helps in the realization of the truth. Today, as we are experiencing a global pandemic, among so many other issues such as climate change, the need for inclusivity, gender equality, mental health, that the need for education is higher than ever. As you're joining in, turn your video on if you are able to. It always feels very, very good to see faces rather than names on the screen. Put yourself on mute when not speaking to avoid background noise. Switch to the gallery to see all the attendees when the screen is not shared. Please rename yourself as name underscore city. And if you are associated with Teach for India, rename yourself as role underscore name, just the way I have done. Once again, I welcome you all for the session. Now it's time for introduction. I would request you all to go to the chat box and tell us your name, your current location. If you are not a student or employee uh, or intern and volunteer of any college or institution, and what was your favorite subject in school or college? I repeat, go to the chat box and tell us your name, your current location, if you are a student or employee or intern and volunteer of any college or institution, and what was your favorite subject in school or college? Now you're typing your introduction. I'm Pradipta. After doing my master's in comparative literature from Jadavpur University, I worked in rural Rajasthan, where I recall the need for access to books. Um, literature in my life has acted as a therapy, which helped me open up and increased my level of self-acceptance in many folds. And this led me to open two libraries in the tribal village of Sakroda and Talamagri in Udaipur, Rajasthan. These eight years in the education sector have been truly fulfilling. And today, as a recruitment manager in Teach for India, I have the opportunity to be in touch with courageous, wonderful minds like you all. And that gives me hope for a society, for Tagore's vision of education to come alive. My favorite subject in school was literature. And now I can see that the chat box has started buzzing. I can see Udita Sharkar's favorite was biology. Hi, Suranjana. I can see English economics as the favorite subject for a lot, lot many of you. So without much delay, let me bring in our panels today. Shahin Mistri, 
a social activist and educator. She's the founder of Akanksha Foundation, a non-profit educational initiative, and is also the CEO and founder of Teach for India. She's someone who deeply believes in the power of education to transform societies and the world. Dhanishri is a 10th grade student leader from Pune. She believes in the importance of students' voice and is working towards, the, towards that through her project, <coughs> Abhav Tarang. Somshu Chatterjee is an engineer from Jadavpur University and was with Tata Group for more than three years before joining the fellowship in 2015. He worked with TFI as staff post his fellowship and is presently leading Akanksha Foundation's newest site in Nagpur as director of schools, where he's currently setting up six new schools. Jigyasa Labru is a 2014 Teach for India alumnus. She's the founder, co-founder and CEO of Slam Out Loud, impacting 4.7 million children across 19 countries through the power of art. Riddhi Samat is a 2020 Teach for India Fellow in Mumbai. She's an optimist who believes in passion and hope for youth-led change in this world of inequities. Oindrila Shannal is a 2020 Teach for India Fellow and an alumnus of Jadavpur University and London School of Economics. So here we present to you a power-packed panel of diverse stakeholders, a student, fellows, alumni, and the founder of the organization. With that, over to you, Shaheen, for our session on the transformational power of education. Thank you so much. Um, it's just, I mean, just hearing that um, has filled me with, with such hope. And I, I, I feel so privileged to do conversations like this, um, to really reconnect with the people behind this movement. And so to be able to be a little bit of the bridge between people that have joined the movement and are really fighting for equity every single day and people interested in joining the movement um, who have a very similar hope in their hearts, that's just a very beautiful place to sit. And so I feel very lucky to, to be here. Um, I, I wanna just quickly, quickly frame where we're talking today about what an equitable India looks like. Um, and while that has always mattered through history, um, I'm not sure I've ever seen it matter as clearly as in this moment in history, um, coming through a pandemic that has made those of us who are close to the ground realize how when bad things happen, they impact people with disadvantage, people living in poverty disproportionately. And that calls upon all of us um, to not just ask like, what can we do in a small way, but to really ask like, what's the maximum we can do towards building just a more equitable India? And so I'm, I'm just really, really excited to explore this topic a little bit more um, with all of you on the panel. Um, before I jump into my first question, uh, you know, I, I, I did a similar conversation a few weeks ago, and as I was thinking about it, the image that came back to me in terms of a, a personal image from my life when I think of inequity was the coming back to India every year. Um, we actually lived in the U.S., and I would travel back to visit grandparents over my summer vacations. And I, I remember always being like profoundly impacted by that last stretch in the airplane when the plane passes over Mumbai to land in Mumbai. And I would look out of the window and I would see literally adjoining each other high rise buildings and then the sprawling low-income communities. Um, and I, I would ask myself year after year, like, what is it that I have done to deserve the opportunities that I have had? Um, you know, why did I grow up in the high rise and another child my age grow up in the community? And, and what does that mean? Like, what are the implications of that? And really, honestly, it, it took me many years to 
to come up with an answer that I was comfortable with. And that answer very simply was somebody up there um, flipped a coin and I got lucky. And there's nothing else. There's nothing else that put me in a position where I had the opportunity to unleash my potential. And another child equally, if not more talented, more driven, um, just didn't have the opportunities to unleash their potential. And so, you know, my, my own story it, it started out at an age very similar to many of you on this call. Um, I was 18 and I walked into a low income community and I met a child called Pinky. Um, and that child had bright, sparkling eyes. And I will never forget her eyes because I looked at her and I thought, oh my gosh, my first thought was, oh my gosh, this child has such potential. What will this child be? Will she be the next great social entrepreneur? Will she be the next great activist? Will she be the next prime minister of our country? And then as I had that thought, the next thought in my mind almost immediately was what if she doesn't get those opportunities? What if she doesn't get those opportunities? Like that's gonna make all the difference. And so we dive into that idea on this conversation today because the Teach for India Fellowship is simply about creating those opportunities. And as I was listening to the introduction, I was thinking that like the people that you're gonna hear from today the, the traditional notion may be that they are leaders, they are leading change in their classrooms, in their communities, in their city, in their country, even across the world. But I think of them more as ladders. You know, what does it mean to, to be a ladder, to create that space to elevate others? Where it's where, where you know it may be Soam's like new new amazing job of setting up schools in Nagpur, like. How can you be a ladder there or Jigyasa spreading the arts and creating those opportunities or, or Riddhi in her classroom? It, you know, the idea of can we come into the fellowship and become a ladder and elevate others? Um, so with that, I'm going to launch into my, my first question and I'm going to first invite our youngest member on our panel, Dhanashri. Um, in because I love I love hearing from adults as well I promise but I love hearing from children more than I love hearing from adults so Dhanashri may get a, a, a the maximum questions on the panel because of that but Dhanashri if you could start us off like let's start with the truth and we will move to the hope but let's start with inequity and if you could share a little bit in your own experience growing up in a low-income community what does life look like for you and other children in your community? Yes, Didi, sure. Um, as you well described, that India is full of inequity, which, like, which is here, and I think um, it's 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 just that we. It's not about that we don't have the potential, or um, like it's just that we didn't we don't get the opportunities. Like we start everything from scrap. Right, like uh, we need to fight for the water, for the basic needs to be fulfilled. We need to fight for it, and I think that's what makes us problem solvers every day. That's not a new concept; it's just what we practice every day, and 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 that what that's what we can see that a lot of leaders come from these communities because they got opportunities, and because they were lucky. But I wish that we don't want to be lucky. We want to be equal and we want to get those opportunities that everyone gets. And it should be really common, like getting educated, studying in a good university shouldn't be a very great thing. It should be uh, like everyone else does. So it's, it's really um, like when I see uh, the things around me, it's really disheartening that why only us right sometimes we ask this question and um, i might not have an answer to this but then i think that the only way we could tackle this is through providing excellent education so like like there is inequity in every in every sector like from from the resources 
um, there is not an equal distribution of resources that we have. There is no equal distribution of opportunities. There is no equal distribution of, you know, electricity, of of everything i would say there is corruption in every sector so the only way to um, tackle this problem or to come up with solutions is to create leaders in every part of the country like we we can't work with only one part or uh, just one group of people and try to uh, get solutions from them we need to move to every group and try to uh, work there at every level. Thanks, Tanishri. And Riti, let, let me bring you in on the same on the same idea of your understanding of inequity for the children you are teaching, and specifically at this moment of time, coming through a pandemic, school closures. What are some of like the complexities and challenges you see with your children? Um, I think a lot of it is, I mean, Tanishree brought it out beautifully as always. Well. It's such a pleasure to hear her speak. But I think, um, so, you know, till about three months ago, I was still in college and I thought I knew what inequity means as a concept. Like I knew the statistics, I knew the facts of it, but I didn't know the stories at all. So just when I was stepping into my classroom as a new teacher, um, you know, there was this overwhelming urge that every single second of their day should be productive, every single second should be, you know, just, they should be engaged in something amazing, something that's adding value to them. And I, I think just getting hit with the reality of what all these kids do in a day, what all challenges they put up with, just besides uh, having to handle a full workload, having to handle a full course load in school and everything. I mean, I, I teach a classroom of eighth grade students. And this is just something that I can really capture in equity for me is um, there was a complete blank period from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. in their schedule, right? And I was very curious. I, I was wondering why no teacher had thought of, you know, involving them in some kind of activity at that time. So I spoke to the children and I found out that in their community, every house gets a 10 minute slot in that two hour period where they can go and collect water for their house. And these are teenagers, so they're taking on that responsibility for their home. So for those two hours, they all just have to be sitting ready to leave everything and go and bring water for their house and they don't get water at all that day. And it made me so mad that this is a reality 10 minutes away from where I live and I'm so oblivious to it. It's, it's something that hasn't even occurred to me, right? So and I think the pandemic has just made it so much worse because these kids, school was the one place they could go to uh, to get away from these realities at home. School was the one physical place where they could get that space to just explore themselves and to just be a student. And I think that is something that they have lost. And um, I think that just kind of amplifies all the challenges that they live with. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So powerful. Um, Jigyasa, I'm going to bring you, you in and, and ask, of course, drawing upon your your fellowship experience as well, but as you've been able to zoom out and look across the country at the inequity that, that children face, can you share thoughts on like what you're seeing, especially over the, the last couple of years of the pandemic? Yes, of course. Um, I think the way we sometimes look at inequity is a lot in terms of like things that money can buy. But inequity also exists in things that we think are free. Um, I think one of the reasons why I thought about doing my work as an organization and not simply as a passion project was this incident where I was once in a classroom in Kashmir and I asked children to write a poem about the emotions they were feeling. And in that classroom, the first five children, you know, whom I asked, you know, what is the emotion you're writing the poem about? shows the emotions of anger, confusion, hate, sadness. And that totally threw me off as a teacher. Um, I did not know how to respond. Um, but it also made me think about how this question of like how you're feeling does not require material sources. It's a question you can ask for free. But so much inequity exists also in the emotional support that children who come from different backgrounds get Often this inequity exists in terms of how we dream for the children who come from low-income communities. Our dreams are about them doing academically well 
or getting a job and everything beyond that self discovery discovering passion everything that's sort of like a given for other children um does not exist for children just because they come from a certain socio economic background and i've seen it only become exacerbated in the times of the pandemic um especially especially for girls um you know uh, who have to take on more of household work or if the parents need to make a choice between who gets to go to let's say a private school it's, it's the girls who don't um and and that's where we are yeah no oh, thank you for adding those those nuances to inequity you know i think it's so important that we don't just see it as as income but there are so many forms of of inequity um if i take that sort of broad canvas of inequity andrela come to to you uh, uh what's your dream for an equitable india like how do you think about what what is an equitable india look like to you in your classroom but also as we think about expanding to kolkata like what is it what does it look like to you there i think we just have to realize that oh, there are different sectors of people right with their own potential and i think one thing that we need to keep in mind is that there need to be equal opportunity so when we talk about equality there needs to be equal opportunity but at the same time they should be able to articulate what they want i mean when we look at education or when we look at health when we look at the intersections of it um most of the time things are not contextualized it's just like a one size fits all policy right something that we've also faced in our classrooms that's just one curriculum and the more we have these structures in place i think we are moving farther away from equity or being inequitable i think equity in 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 the nation right so more to do to more to do with tailor means structures so a place where a nation where you know kids can and and i do believe that the more voices we include of kids the better it will be for us so more of what they want and how they want uh, to govern i think that's definitely one of the ways that i see equity with uh, setting thanks so i would love to bring you in uh, again both both sides of the question if you could touch upon like what is inequity look like to you and and what's your vision for for equity and and what what in the fellowship has endured as you set out with the you know first time akanksha moving out of um out of mumbai pune uh, to nagpur and you're setting up six schools like what what has endured in the fellowship that you are taking as you do that uh right sure shine uh so i think for me uh the inequity piece i mean i i witnessed it a little bit when i was in college i'm from jadavpur uh, like many of you might be from uh in this audience and for me inequity has been very contextual like if i take this this sample size of i think 120 odd people that we are here uh can we say that we are all on the same footing maybe not like maybe not we all might be different but we can all say that okay we are privileged because we have access to certain basic things which will lead us to be successful in life i think for me inequity is that when you do not have access to th- basic things like what dhanashri said basic health care basic education basic uh nutrition and food and which prevents you to be to which prevents you to not only be successful but prevents you the opportunity to be successful education i don't see as an end uh like it it, it is basically an opportunity to be, to, to be successful and uh that's what i think uh, i would say angers me uh, because that i think should be should be available to each and every one and i think a uh, fellowship for me um, was a crucible i think it gave me a very nuanced understanding of what inequity is and where does it exactly impact i mean um when i came into the fellowship i was a very naive 23 24 year old and i thought that okay there are these three four problems in education which can be solved by putting in the correct amount of effort but i think 6 months into the classroom i realized how wrong i was and i think fellowship for me was a crucible it helped me define what i want to do exactly and where i want to do and uh shahin to your next question what does an equitable india look like i think it it i derive it from the thing that angers me that an equitable india looks like where i have the option to avail an opportunity that is not dictated by where i come from uh what i do with that opportunity is secondary but at least i have that 
option to access that opportunity i am not prevented because i don't have drinking water i am not prevented because i do not have access to health care i am not prevented because i need to work for my family as an earning member but i have access to all those opportunities yeah thank you so much um and thank you for being so concise i as i asked you those questions i said oh my god those three questions in in and of themselves could have been a 24 hour answer um jigrasa i'm curious about your your answer to like what did the fellowship teach you and what has endured and if you can maybe talk a little bit about what you've done also because i think it's so powerful so if you can talk a little bit about yeah your journey really quickly and then like what from the fellowship has endured you asked the question to me shine right okay great um so i i quickly share what i do um i'm really really passionate about children no matter where they come from getting safe spaces for expression especially creatively finding their own voice and how we sort of do that is um uh, i uh, founded an organization called slam out loud and we use art forms like storytelling theater spoken word poetry and visual art to create that space for children um now coming to the fellowship i think um the fellowship for me was um so so the decision to join the fellowship came from a place of i can be a really really great teacher and please take me in and that was really what i said in my teach for india interview uh, and you all took me in and um, as i started working in my classroom i think one of the things that i noticed was the spaces that i had for creative expression while growing up my children did and so i started bringing in a lot of like poetry music into my own classroom and i saw my children change like children who would have never raised their hands in the class began to do that one of the kids who was extremely shy earlier never made any friends found an identity of a poet in the class at the end of like my two years as a teacher um a kid whom you know um, other children would find difficulty to speak to because she was so reserved suddenly became this kid other children were taking feedback from on their poems she had done a tedx talk she had performed at events all over delhi sharing her poems talking about things that are to her she had traveled to bangalore in a flight uh, and performed at the national youth poetry slam um all of these things happened but i think more than anything what the fellowship created for me was a space to see an idea of safe spaces for expression come alive um it created for me a space to understand what happens when children are giving spaces to talk about what is important to them um it gave me a structured support system uh, for example like if i had to do this for myself on my own like it would have taken me like 7 or 8 years but the 2 years of my fellowship gave me a question a problem that i thought was worth solving in the long run not the answers not the solution but a question or a problem that i wanted to hold on and it continues to be a problem that i want to solve for um the fact that our children don't have spaces to develop social emotional learning skills develop their own voice um yeah thank you it's so beautiful and harini maybe you can put the the slam out loud and and the akanksha foundation website so people can learn more but i mean i i every time i've heard your kids jigyasa recite poetry uh that they have written about the most important things in their heart um you see the power of it like you can feel the power of it through students and so very strongly encourage folks on the call to go look look these websites up and just listen to some of the the poetry by students um danashri i'm going to come back to you um you know jigyasa talked a little bit about what being a teacher taught her and how it left her with a problem um and a question in her heart to solve um from the other side of that question like what did an education mean to you like what did your teachers mean in your life and your education mean in your life yeah for me education acts as exposure um exposure to the outer world exposure to the art forms exposure um to get accepted as well so education um i think empowers me to do other things um to look at problems as opportunities 
and it enables me and sort of gives the knowledge um to you know solve those problems uh, in a very structured way so yeah academics plays a very very important role no no question in that but with that i think education is 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 of development of a personality like throughout these years um if i look at myself um say 2 to 3 years ago um i see the growth that i that has had in me so i think it's all because of my educators and the mentors who have been throughout to help me out in anything and everything and to support me um whenever i am in problem and to act as partners when uh, in education so doing a lot of projects and bringing new ideas in the classroom is always due to the support of the educators so that's the role they have played i think educators have always been um so like i always share this incident uh when i talk about partnership so once i had a really crazy idea of students managing events that happen in school so like i thought that the events are for us right the sports day the annual day is for us so why not we organize it i went uh, with this idea to my principal and and you know with all that um, excitement and all that uh, zest i told her about it and um, i i could see that her spontaneity her uh, practicality and my excitement um, my uh, my creativity when they came together they the the idea grew really beautifully so i think that's that's where the importance of educators is highlighted and uh, when these two partners work and co create spaces and understand each other that's when um i think student voice nurtures as well through this process um and it and things become not like not the educator does for students like i like i have seen educators say that um i teach for these kids to learn but it more becomes that i learn with my kids so that transition happens somewhere so i think education has been a process of a lot of experimenting a lot of learning and finding myself at the end thank you so much and i just want to quickly um uh thank Uh, i think nitesh in the chat window has asked like what is this meeting about a beautiful question let me just step back and clarify so so this meeting is actually um for people that are interested in joining the teach for india fellowship and it's a chance to explore the idea that is most important to teach for india which is like how do we bring equity in education so through this meeting you're listening to a teach for india student current teach for india teachers as well as alumni of teach for india who continue to work in education so i hope that i hope that clarifies um okay riddhi i'm going to come back to you and i know you have like 72 or some crazy number of you call them dreamers um students um I- i'm coming to you with the most the most difficult question perhaps which is like how do we get to an equitable india like we're all grounded in the truth of the problem many of us share a common dream of equity but but when you see how difficult it is every single day with your 72 children um what is the way to get there and how do you keep yourself motivated through the challenges of teaching how do we get there is a beautiful question it's something we ask every single day and i definitely don't have an answer for it um in complete terms but i think when i just think of um you know when i think of my classroom like you said when i call them 72 dreamers what what it does for me is just it reminds me that you have to start somewhere you have to start somewhere you have to start small and you have to do it every single day it is not about um you know just it's you know we talk about inequity as this kind of wall that our kids their parents their communities have internalized right and you can't break that wall down in one day you can't expect them to not see it as a wall in one day but you can give them the tools to overcome that wall tomorrow right so i think just just the tfi idea of zooming into a problem fixing it for now moving out and then looking at it 
and see what impact you've made. I think that's something that helps you figure out how to start. Um, in terms of what keeps me motivated, I think you do need to operate with just a little bit of optimism, just a little bit of hope. And I think working with children is a great way to do that because in spite of everything, we spoke so much about what these kids live with, what inequity they live with. And in spite of all of that, they have so much hope. They look at the world with so much wonder, so much optimism. And it's infectious, honestly. It's, it's addictive being in their company, seeing that kind of joy, seeing them believe that no matter where we've come from, we can go anywhere from here. I think just my kids keep me motivated. Just their small successes, their small progress. It's just, I think that's what keeps me going at this point. Yeah, such a beautiful thought and so much resonance in my heart with that, with that answer of what keeps me going as well. Um, Angela, I, I wanted to bring a slightly different dimension to the question. And, and I know like when I saw your class, you were very rooted in also education as a tool to build India, to build like the constitutional values that underpin our constitution. And yet when we look around us, they're breaking down all the time, equality, liberty, fraternity, justice. Can you talk a little bit about how you see education as a tool for building India? So the idea, if, if we sort of equip our kids with the necessary skills, uh, mindsets, knowledge pieces, they in turn, they impact the policy structure, right? I mean, they will make informed choices. The hope is that they will make informed choices in the coming years. And through those informed choices, hopefully the society will change because a classroom is, is sort of a microcosm of the society that we all live in. And I think it is very important um, as teachers that we understand uh, the nitty gritties of the way we teach social sciences as well, something that we've been trying to do in our classes as well. Talking about justice, tying in their community to the nation, right? Tying in their community to the global problems. Hoping that in the years to come, uh, they'd, they'd make informed choices, they'd be those change makers, like we all want. And I think the DIA would also sort of agree and all of, all, all of you in this call. And I think that's, that's the whole idea uh, that hopefully we are building the future leaders, future generations in their own little way, they will try to you know, bring in change, make informed choices. And then in effect, uh, there'll be a ripple effect in the way that we perceive society to be. Thank you. Som, can you talk a little bit about your, your work and what keeps you motivated as well on this journey of like one step at a time towards an equitable India? Uh, sure, I think uh, my work presently is like uh, Akanksha Foundation runs network of schools in collaboration with the local municipal government. We have recently partnered with the Nagpur Municipal Corporation and we are running six schools here. So the schools are owned by the government. They are government school for all administrative purposes, but the teachers and the training is for uh, by Akansha Foundation. And I think uh, what keeps me motivated, and I think uh, after my fellowship, when I was in Teach for India as a staff and post that also when I've been Akansha, I think uh, it's it's this uh, it's this contradiction of, I think, what, we, what in Teach for India we called as the truth and the hope. I think the truth is that a lot of our kids right now, a lot, I think we have more than 300 million kids in India who are not getting the opportunity and I won't say only education opportunity in a very broader sense the opportunity what maybe Jagyasa is providing or the opportunity that Riddhi is providing in a classroom they're not getting that that's the reality and my hope is that just imagine if 300 million kids or more than 300 million kids get that opportunity just imagine the kind of leaders that they would be just imagine the kind of problems that they would be able to solve uh, the the complexity of the problems that we have right now I think that is the thought which motivates me that uh, it's it's for the greater good of all of us. Like we owe it to ourselves to ensure that and our planet and our home to ensure that these kids get the opportunity. Just imagine if 300 million Indians get the education that they deserve, what this country could look like. And I think that's what keeps me waited. That's what scares me. And uh, yeah, that's what gets me to work every day, I think. Thank you so much. And we're going to we're going to open up in just a couple of minutes um, for questions from the audience. But before that, one last question for all of you. I would love if each of you could just give a short answer to it. Um, starting with you, maybe Dhanashri. If you had one hope or wish for how people listening on this call 
could contribute to the children of India, what would that hope be? Yeah. So my hope to all the people on this call, like from different sectors, is like in whatever way possible, you can make a difference. It might be very small, like a very small step, but it is still a step. So, you know, like don't look at change as a very big thing, as a very complex puzzle, but understand that every piece that you are doing is joining as a solution. So like in whatever way possible, you can make a difference um, that can be through joining the fellowship or just um, like impacting children in your own way possible, maybe teaching some um, art form to them or doing anything, any sort of thing that you can do and, and just um, contribute to the nation's um, children as a whole. And uh, yeah, I, I really believe that every small step that we take um, creates a domino effect. So that is what, uh, take small steps and just do it. Don't think about, um, don't think about the result, but just do it. The process is just amazing. Beautiful thought, like small steps, just take a small step, start, do something. Um, so I'm over to you. What, what is your hope for the audience? I, I do hope that all of you, uh, like as Dhanushri said, do believe that this problem can be solved. And we all have a very pivotal part to uh, solve this issue and uh, believe in yourself, believe in the potential of the millions of kids that you see around you. Uh, and more importantly, believe that you can make a difference and do whatever that is in your capacity, not for the next two years, but for the rest of your lives to ensure that everyone around you gets an opportunity that they so truly deserve. Beautiful. So the theme of belief, like, can, can we believe enough? Riti. Just adding to why I've shared, um, I think, I know a lot of you are college students, but um, so if, I think when you're young, you have this tendency of waiting for the perfect opportunity to do something, to start somewhere. I would say there is no perfect opportunity. Just take whatever opportunity is coming your way and, and do good with it. I would say that. Um, and again, I, I, I think just at one point, step out of your reality and step into someone else's as often as you can. I think that that in itself is such a big lesson and it's something we don't do often enough. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Angela. I think uh, the others have beautifully summed it up. But at the same time, I mean, just identifying problems around you. I think it's very important to sort of, you know, uh, sort of root your understanding of what your community needs and then maybe find a solution to that because there will be problems of plenty. And like Riddhi mentioned, there will always be like another time that, you know, maybe this is not the right opportunity. But if we don't do it collectively, I think it's very, like, it's going to be like a very problematic time for our nation as well. Because after all, it's a reflection of who we are, right? So I think maybe this is the yeah. time that we take the ownership. And that's the one yeah. hope that I would have. Yeah, thank you, Jigyasa. Yes, thanks, Shaheen. I think there's something that I really want to show. It's this mask that I wear. It's a very colorful mask. It can be worn from both sides. It has a chain. And the last two years of the pandemic have been long and hard. And yet this mask uh, in, it all, in all its colors is able to bring me joy. What I take away from it is that the work of social change is hard and arduous, but there is also room for joy. There will always be opportunity for joy. And I hope we can lean in and experience that joy because you will it's so much fun uh, being a teacher it's just amazing thanks Jigyasa and we're going to go to questions from um from our folks listening in and and please all of you just put more questions in in the chat window as as you're speaking um but we're going to come down a little bit from an equitable India to actually the fellowship because I think people have questions about that and Jigyasa, I'm going to bring you back in first. There's a question um, on what are the major challenges, especially as a fresh graduate, going into a classroom of kids 
from a very different background, from a low-income background. Um, can you talk about some of the major challenges and, and what you can do to sort of prepare to face them? Yeah, that's an important, great question. Um, I think I'll share one particular challenge and I'll also share what kind of mindset shift helped me overcome that challenge. Um, I think going as a student, so I I just, you know, uh, gotten out of college, joined the fellowship, uh, started teaching in the class and took so much responsibility on myself that, you know, I one, I need to be a great teacher. Second, I need to be very, very, aware of the context my children come from um, and I also need to be someone who creates a lot of like joy uh, in the classroom and I struggled and I failed um, every single day and it made it worse because I was feeling like all the responsibilities on my shoulders but when I do that when I take all that responsibility on my shoulders what I'm refusing to do is to share power what I'm refusing to do is create space for students voice and the mindset shift that sort of happened was that I started feeling or started communicating, communicating to my kids that if we are not able to understand something as a class, it's not just me as a teacher who's failing. We're all failing together, but we're in this together and we'll solve this together. And we did. And sharing that responsibility, one, shifted that power dynamics in the classroom, but second, it also gave me a chance to fail and learn from there. And it gave children a chance uh, to know that their voice and what they feel really, really matters in their education. And um, that's sort of how I navigated that particular challenge. Thanks, Chikyasa. Anjula, there's a, there's a really important question um, asking about like blended learning and, and technology. And I think it's a big, quite, very different to teach online. Um, I know you have very young students. I am still in awe knowing how you engage them online, but can you talk a little bit about this blended model um, and what, what it has taken for you to sort of learn it and embrace it? I think, uh... The first part is, so I teach 10th graders and a lot of them are tech savvy and they've learned it themselves. So initially, of course, there were a lot of qualms regarding how to do it. And what, what sort of helped me and my co-fellows sort of navigate around is the way that they came for help. So like, like we always say, they know their context the best. You just need to ask the kids, uh, just ask them what they need. So like asking them for their help has definitely helped uh, me sort of, you know, make meaning of the blended learning format. There were times when, uh, you know, like let's say a lesson in history went south and there were some kids who took it, took it upon themselves to, you know, conduct special classes for, let's say, the other students. So sort of bringing these ideas, something that Jigyasa also talked about, like bringing more of student voices, sharing power has also helped me in the blended learning, I think, format. Ensuring that, you know, they are not just like the passive receptors, but also giving them the onus to take it upon themselves to, I think, uh, also create these spaces for their fellow. I think that's definitely been one of the ways that the learning has worked. Of course, there are other challenges, but yeah. I think challenges will be plenty. Thank you. And, and Riti, the, um, the, the other part of that question is about inclusive education and thinking about like how different the needs are of different children. I'm sure a subset of your children also have learning difficulties. Um, and, and many, many behavioral and other challenges. What do you do to reach out to individual kids and give kids what they need, especially kids who may need a different type of support? I think this is a very big part of all our classrooms now, not just because um, there are more children who need special attention, but we are so much more aware. And I think my answer includes a lot of what everyone on this panel does. I think firstly, something Jigyasa talked about, just creating safe spaces where children feel like they have the right, the comfort and the opportunity to share what is troubling them or what they need help with. Um, I think children will tell you um, in some way, if, if not verbally, they will reach out in some way and let you know that they are struggling and you just have to learn to pick up on those cues. I think something that we do, it's easy to get lost in a class of 72 children, right? Especially where some are very self-sufficient, some are very driven, very hardworking and are fitting that kind of box of, of what we, of, you know, what schools maybe look for. But I think just um, 
kind of centering yourself in the fact that every child can learn, but just not in the same way. I think just reminding yourself of that fact every single day, right? So if, if that child has not been able to learn, it's not, be not because of something they're doing, it's because of you not being able to give them the education that they need. So um, I think another thing I want to talk about is Teacher India's system of support. Uh, one part of it is our volunteers, right? So right now in my classroom, we have 12 volunteers who work with kids in small batches of five, six students. So every child besides what they get in, in I mean, as part of a classroom is also getting that special attention. So um, yeah, I think that's something that's part of the DFI model that works really well with bringing in inclusive. Thank you. And, and just building on that, I, I want to just try and address maybe the, the other couple of questions that have come up around language and around urban rural and just explain that the fellowship is sort of part one of what Teach for India uh, thinks about. It's almost the, the learning ground, the ground where you get exposed to children, start learning what it means um, to be a teacher and to contribute. But the alumni movement beyond that is where folks go off and, and do a range of different things in education. So SOM is setting up schools in Nagpur, Jigyasa is focused on safe spaces and, and um, the emotional growth of children. Another alum may be running schools, another alum may be working at the policy level with government. The alumni movement is spread across urban and rural India. It's also spread across multiple different languages. I, I'm assuming slam out loud also, Chigyasa is doing work now across multiple languages. In addition to that, TFI runs another program where we support entrepreneurs um, in locations all around India. Um, it's called TFI X to actually set up their own versions of the TFI fellowship in the vernacular language rooted in local leadership. So our very, very big hope is that we can continue to be more diverse, more inclusive, but at the same time, take steps slowly so that we can ensure we're doing um, what we can do well, because the work is so hard and so complex. I think everyone on this call will, um, on the panel will agree that like, Teaching is just not an easy thing to do well. Um, it's a tough, tough thing to do. So, so with that, I, I know we've run out of time for questions. I just want to hand over to Jigyasa for two more minutes. Um, I, I suddenly thought that it would be beautiful um, to close this out before I hand back to the team uh, with just a short um, video of one of her kids. Um, you know, I, I, I was told to share at the end of this call um, what is my vision for an excellent education? And as I thought about this and I was hearing all of you speak, I thought like my vision comes alive in seeing our children one child at a time, one step at a child at a time. So, so let's turn over to Jigyasa to just share something really quickly with us and then hand back. And monitor. All right, this is a pretty short one minute form that we can all listen to. Indian nomenclature, finding out numerous words from Hindu literature is just like those beautiful but unreal flowers that are just for display. They name their daughter Richa but never allowed her to wish for education. They call their wife Virangana but always forced her to be on her knees. Durga always has to be silent and polite in front of her husband. Kalpana is never allowed to imagine a comfortable life. Prerna is not allowed to express her inspiration. And Sapna has to quit her dream to prove the world that she is a good mother. Adarsh is never taught to respect his wife's ambition. And Saraswati, Saraswati never gets to see a school. It is just making others fool. The people who are named after flowers never get to bloom. And I... I am named Muskan, but whenever I'm forbidden to go out alone, it feels like a pure shame. A pure shame that I have a bright smile. Thank you, Chikyasa. So beautiful. So beautiful. And I think, you know, if, if you're really wondering, like, what is Teach for India? Um, and what are we trying to do as a movement of alumni working towards an equitable India? It is that, it is that belief that 
education, that voice, that partnership, all of these concepts can empower a child to truly speak um, from their heart in ways that, that take our breath away. Um, so with that, Pradipta, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you, Shaheen. Thank you, Dhanashri, Som Subra, Jigyasa, Riddhi, and Oindrela. We hope to bring all of this, all of what you had talked about. The Teach for India Fellowship is the opportunity to create opportunities for others. It is the ladder to elevate many others. We want to be more diverse, but we'll take it slowly. As Shaheen says, teaching is not an easy thing to do. We need to, be, we need to have equal opportunities. Studying in a great university shouldn't be something special, but something that is accessible to each and every one. The opportunity should not be dominated by anyone. Everyone should get the opportunity that, that they deserve. We need to operate from a little bit of optimism and children are optimistic. It is infectious to be with them. And as Dhanashri says, in whatever way possible, you can make a lot of difference. So no Durga needs to be silent and all Ichhas will get the opportunity and all Muskans will smile. And many, many, many more hopes to the city of joy, Kolkata, as we enter. And we hope to see you as a part of this global movement because the collective efforts will make a lot of difference. But I have a question for Shaheen. Shaheen, you have been an educator for more than three decades. What is Teach for India's vision for East? Sorry, say the last part again. Vision for? Yeah. Vision for East as we are entering in Calcutta. For the East. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my vision uh, for the East, when we think about an equitable India for years, the most asked question to me was, why are we not in the East? Why are we not in the East? We have a presence in, in the rest of the country. Um, and really like our heart wanted to start in the East. And so my, my vision is not dissimilar to, to what it is for any child across India. I just feel very, very excited that we will be able to put um, young people, driven people, into classrooms to unleash um, the potential of Kolkata's children. Um, and that feels very, very special. I'm thinking, what is the, what is the Bengali equivalent of the poem uh, we just heard? And how can kids really shine in their very, very diverse and unique ways all across Kolkata? And not just children, but what does it mean to build a movement of leaders in Kolkata? People that are gonna wake up and say, wait a minute, how do we get an excellent equitable education to all children in Kolkata? And that's really essentially what we try to do. Go into a region, ask and hold that question, and then slowly, step by step, build a movement of leaders that will work together towards that vision. And thank you, Shaheen. We are so, so excited about this. Thank you once again to each and every one of you. And if you want to be a part of this global movement and are interested in knowing more about the fellowship and how you can apply, please stay back for the next 15 minutes. Others, thank you for being here today and standing up for India. Good night. Over to you, thank Pragya. You, thank, thank you, Shaheen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Pradipta, uh, for handing it over to me. So for Folks, uh, those of you, we've been receiving a lot of questions regarding the fellowship, how do we apply, what uh, Teach for India going to look like in East, so on and so forth. So for everyone who's interested to learn more about the fellowship, kindly stay back for uh, not even 15 minutes, it will max take you know uh, 10 minutes for me. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know quickly play a song. Uh, what we will do is as you listen to this song, just be around, don't drop off, and then quickly come back um, and we will share about the fellowship opportunities. Best. You can be the King Kong banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You can talk.
heart, the guy go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. Yeah. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Standing in the Hall of Fame. Be leaders, be astronauts, be champions, be truth seekers. 